people want to be heard, mm-hmm. especially women. They, they, I've never met a woman who doesn't want to talk about herself, right? She wants to tell you her hopes and dreams, what she likes. She was now she may not feel comfortable with everybody, but if you make her feel comfortable, right? She will tell you everything you want to know. And if you shut up long enough, you literally can write a, what like a serial killer profile of who she is, what she is, what she likes, what's her favorite color, what's what's her social security number, what kind of panties she wears, what you know, and you can learn so much if you and the way you do that is by asking, hey yo, what's up? Square Pin Brigade on this episode. We have my boy Keep comedian Eman Morgan. We're here to discuss why don't uh why we don't like to admit as men, we don't like to admit that we need help, how trauma affects men, how to better self, to, to, how to take things step by step to make yourself better, and the place religion has in your dating life. I also get into it hem- heavy on this religion shit because it's, he mm, says boy. some shit that I didn't like, but whatever. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, uh, but we are grateful and praise be to God for bringing us all our listeners and our Patreon followers is what you I say. <laughs> Thank God for our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Manschool202. If you, uh, whether or not you believe in God, you do believe in Manschool202 and support yeah. us. And we appreciate those who support us because it keeps the show going and we get to do bonus content every week. Plus, the classic episodes uh, that you've been looking for, all yeah, the old episodes up. of the Beige Phillips Thanks show. I've been, to Harry. I've been putting them up, uh, you know, and they're we got a bunch of them up now, and there more will continue until we get to all of them. So you have no more excuse. Uh, so sign up, patreon.com slash manschool202 for the bonus content and the old school episodes. And if you want a consultation from me, you can sign up by emailing me at advicefromharry at gmail.com. And if you want one from Dante, go to dantenero.com and click on consult and set them up. I'm not an alpha male. I'm not a beta male either. I'm just a better man. Better man. Put your happiness first, because if you don't, they won't. Yo, what's up, Square Pippa Game? GYBB, get your balls back. WWDD, what would Dante do to sexual revolution is being podcasted, and I am excited. Now, I know I've said that 500 times before, but this time I mean it. Um, we got a special guest, but first and foremost, Harry, what's popping? You good? Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm more than good, man. I'm living a great life here, even though I'm having a tough time keeping these alligators down. I get it. I get it. Uh, let me introduce uh, our guest today, a funny dude, good friend of mine. I watched this guy grow and and uh, literally and, and develop into a literally into led to a a, a handsome young man. <laughs> uh, give it up for E Man Morgan, y'all. Give it up for E Man. What up, E? What's going on, guys? What's up, How you folks? Doing, bro? I'm doing well, man. Doing well. Glad to be back on, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been, been a while, while since we had you on. A lot of changes. Lots of changes, man. Lots of changes. A lot of changes. And then what's interesting is is he has become kind of like one of my little du- my I shouldn't say my little dudes, it's just because I'm so old. I call him my little, but he's 40. <laughs> yeah. 41. <laughs> 41. 41. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. But it's a it's an interesting That's concept. this many. Yeah, this go this many. <laughs> there so you go. He, well da- listen, so, um, Dante, you've been around for a while, so now even your, your proteges are now developing lower back pain and gray hair. You yeah, know, it happens. It's, it's, it's part of the aging process. That freshman class, you know, we're getting old now. Sure, you don't know. Um but uh he is here with that dumb Pacific background. <laughs> He's on the beach to hide the fact that, you know, we all do it. They were not in a studio apartment. You know, it happens. When he first, when he, when he first had the fitted cap on, he looked like one of, like from the karate movies. You know, the hop sing dudes was like, oh, you, you want rice cakes, noodles? <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, he's my man. He's my man. It's gonna be a good one because um him him and I we've been talking about a lot of shit about comedy, but it's you know, I, I think what I'm trying to it, it explain to E, which I don't wouldn't do this as normal normally because of the fact that um 
how should I put it? I would normally not explain things with the depth that I would to 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 somebody, but just E has been around me so long. And I tend to be a little hard on him. Mm. I feel sometimes I feel bad because I feel like he 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 do, he takes it well. But I know I mean you know Harry I could be Harry don't even Harry don't really ask me questions <laughs> until uh, he really wants to know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you I try to figure it out on my own. He's just like, oh, do I need? Do I really need to ask? I only come for you with emergency questions. Cause I'm not. I don't know. I mean, why do you think that is, Harry? What am I? Am um. I, well, you know, as you. Barry Ribs would say, uh, "Brutally." Oh, Jesus Christ! Brutal. Yeah, I ran into Barry Ribs at a party. If for those who don't know, if you're not in the comedy business, Barry Ribs is a guy who's been around for thirty or forty years. You know, well, and I like Barry, and he's something. He's a guy who looks like Doc Brown from uh, Back to the Future, and he's yeah. he plays Morty, Black Room. 82 yeah. miles per hour. <laughs> yeah, 88 gigawatts or whatever, gigawatts. So uh, I ran into him at a party, and he goes, hey, how, you know, he goes, how's Dante, man? I go, yeah, Dante's doing good. He goes, let me tell you something. That guy, he's brutally honest, bro. <laughs> brutally honest. I go, yeah, yeah, that's what Dante's like. He goes, <laughs> Yeah, brutally honest, man. <laughs> he didn't say anything else <laughs> except brutally. I mean, he must have said it four or five times. He's like, brutally honest, man. <laughs> he didn't say he liked it. He didn't say he didn't say. It. I don't. I still thing. don't know if it was a compliment or not. But he's just like brutally just honest, man. <laughs> over and over again, and and so it, it, a lot of uh, a lot of times. So there's because I'm close with E man. I like I give it to him with no chaser because I mean he should yeah. know he knows that I'm that my intention what my intention is right am I right he, uh you let me swing in the breeze are you gonna say anything you fuck? no totally I was letting you finish I was like letting you get it out yeah well um, it's but out you, <laughs> but see some people Dante actually will never respect that brutally honest stuff so if somebody is actually appreciative of it and wants to grow and actually wants to learn you're getting that help right then and there and i've been around you for so many years that i know is coming from a good place and when i when you tell me you know this and that or we working on a bit or you listen to something the information that you're giving me is really more of you should know better you should know this because sometimes i get lost into i'm trying to direct here i'm trying to go there so you're not really, I don't take it in a way where I'm like, man, he's coming down hard. It's more like, man, he really cares about me. Because there's one thing about you that I truly, truly appreciate and love. If you don't care about the individual, if you have nothing to deal with them, if there's a yeah. lost cause, you're not going to open your mouth. You don't fuck with them. Yeah, you, you will not fuck, fuck with, with them. them. Yeah. So why does Dante open his mouth and actually say a couple mm -hmm. of words to me? He doesn't gain anything from it. But he really sees that like, yo, he's really trying. He's working out a new bit. He's going about it the wrong way. Let me help the little kid out. Let me help the little homie out. So yeah. I took it that way. And yeah, yeah. as a matter of fact, I actually was glad that it was actually today that we're doing the podcast because literally it was what, a few days ago, you were ringing me on a bit. And I swear to you, I made all the adjustments and I did it last night and it came out crisp and clear. Yeah. And I literally was like, man, that's, I love that. That's a yeah. friend helping out a friend. And, and I took it. I didn't take it in a negative way. I, take I was like, yo, it worked. And all you said was, yo, just get to it a little bit quicker. That's all you did. Yeah. yeah. And you and explained it to me. Recognize what's... So it's interesting. I don't know. I don't even know if I if I mentioned this, uh, but I'm, I'm writing a book, <laughs> right? I'm writing a book, and the, the book is called 48 Laws of Pussy, right? <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> So if anybody had known the known the book Forty Eight Laws of Power, right? It uh basically, if you've ever read the book, it gives you a particular principle, right? And then it, it's really like a study course in in power and control and and and, and things. And uh, one of the things that it, uh, it does is it'll give a particular principle. It explains the principle. And then it shows you in the historical reference of 
what what happens when you practice the principle correctly. Then it gives you another historical reference, like it'll talk about Helen of Troy and and how you know what the dynamics, the strategies, and what happened with that, and how what happens when you don't practice it in principle mm. and what those re repercussions are. So what I decided to do, something that I do know is I I know how to I know women, I know sex, I know eating pussy, and I was, but those all of those things are really relevant. It's something that I've said a hundred times that true wisdom is the understanding of underlying concepts, how they relate to situations that seem irrelevant, but really are not. What that means is there is a universal truth that we learn. And in, in, in the course of our life in, 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 uh, in confronting different tasks. And there is a right way to do that, to come out with the best outcome. Um, so if you understand that universal truth and you, you understand why it works, what happens is you can reapply that those same principles over and over again. For instance, um, most people who are uncomfortable and with their own insecurity and stuff, they talk a lot. Um, they will meet a girl and they will be talking and trying to fill the space. Um, now, it, it, if if you're paying attention and you're listening, right, you always gain more information in that situation and rather than any other situation. So first thing is to listen and then to take in as much information because a, a, especially a woman, if you're talking to a woman and you're interested in a woman, if you, people want to be heard, yeah. especially women, they, they, I've never met a woman who doesn't want to talk about herself, right? She wants to tell you her hopes and dreams, what she likes. She was, now, she may not feel comfortable with everybody, but if you make her feel comfortable, right, she will tell you everything you want to know. And if you shut up long enough, you literally can write a, what, like a serial killer profile of who she is, what she is, what she likes, what's her favorite color, what's what's her social security number, what kind of panties she wears, what do, you know, and you can learn so much if you and the way you do that is by asking quick tip leading. by the way, just to jump on that, just so you here's a tip how to become a great gift giver. Especially if you're in a relationship, every once in a while your girl goes, "Oh, I like that." And she'll point at something or she'll go, "Oh, that's kind of cute." You take your phone out later on, you go to the bathroom, write down in a note whatever thing she was pointing at. She likes that hat. She likes that jacket. Come her birthday seven months later, come Christmas time, you go, I don't know what to get her. You pull up that note that you have and you have like seven things that she said she likes and you send that to her uh, and then, I mean, send it to get it for her on, and then yeah. she gets a surprise because she's forgotten about it already. Right. But and, just and because doesn't you, remember, And she doesn't even remember that she told you. She doesn't even remember that she told you. So you become a winner by just just by listening. They give you the information. That's just a side note, but that helped me out a lot. I like uh, giving that tip out. So that's an excellent way to get give give really good gifts that mean something. So you're not panicking. I don't know what the fuck to get her because we don't know what the fuck to get ourselves sometimes. Yeah. Guys are like, one time my girl was like, you know, my friend Kenny uh, Kenny Joseph was having a birthday. She goes. She goes like, well, what is he into? What are you going to, you know, I go, I don't know, chicks. I think he's into chicks, right? What do you mean? I have no idea. She goes, how long have you been friends with him? I go, like 20 years. I don't know what the fuck he like. What am I supposed to? She goes, you don't know anything? I go, I don't know. What the fuck? I don't know. What are, you, what are we? What are we? Getting married? He's yeah. my friend. That's yeah. it. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry, it is, it is rough, like but. that. But women will, women will express what, just in random, in conversation. If, and if you take the time to, to listen it yeah. gives you the more information you have, the more the more you can approach uh, these things with them. And you always want to approach with information. So but there's always this need to be, men always have this need to fill the air with words, mm -hmm. consequence, which is this is, again, a principle that uh, exists in comedy. Um, yeah. I, something I say, comics get paid for their words. Why would you give words out for free? Just give no. them no. what is necessary 
to ex- execute the laughter. Go ahead. Uh, Part of that is that we, as guys, we're trained to think that we're auditioning or interviewing for this spot with this woman. Like it's our job to impress upon them uh, why they should be with us, you know, and that's part of why guys kind of do that also. Like, all right, this is my time to show you everything, to show you I'm interesting, show you this, that, that. And you sometimes you you say too much, you do too much because you're trying to do something to show her everything that you have all at once. Because you feel like yeah. you're on an audition or an interview. Mm. You're singing and dancing for no reason. Yeah, just the dancing and just the tap dancing and singing. Um, yeah. The other thing is um, when you have this abundance of, of singing and dancing and trying to amuse and you're standing on the chair and you're singing, you know, trying to amuse her, you're dancing like a monkey. What you're also saying is that I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of your time. I'm not worthy of your energy. And therefore, I need to fill every second with something to keep you busy. Because God forbid there's a lull in energy or a lull in in speech, then uh, she'll get bored and leave. And um, the other thing is that if you're so abundantly worried about getting her approval, um, you're also saying I'm not worthy and she doesn't feel as though that she has to work um, in the context of any relationship. Like she doesn't have to give anything. So now she becomes the queen up in the, in the tower and she, you know, the gladiators are fighting for her and she's literally like thumbs up or thumbs down. She literally can do that because send me another one. Uh, this one, not yeah. this one, the next one. And so yeah. you don't, you, you have to understand that, and 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 really as a man you bring more to the table you cannot come to the table and not bring something viable mm-hmm. time and time again you see women go uh i'm uh i am the table no you're not you are you are something that needs to be kept interested something that needs to be maintained something that expects you to spend money, time and energy, give safety and all those things. It's not, it is, it is any good relationship is work. Um, And if you pay attention to what the work, what she's saying, not necessarily because they don't always just spell it out. It's the honesty comes when there's no pressure. If there's pressure, then they'll lie to and misdirect and so on. and So so you got to be aware of that as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's weird because, uh, you know, I've watched E grow exponentially in his comedy and as a man, but there's a, there's still this, this thing where I'm always fighting with him about this level of insecurity that he has about how he presents himself. He's also, he's, he's not a tall dude. He's not a big dude. And so even though, Nobody else is thinking that about him. A lot of times, little dudes are thinking in their own head. Can you talk about that, Sami? So, specifically for me, sometimes I do get into that cloud of fluff where I over talk too too much. And there's some days where I can catch myself, and I'm like, "That's way too much. I'm trying way too much, too hard." And then there's some days where I just get lost. Or I'm very nervous about a bid. I really want it to work. I'm on a timetable. I need to finish it by a certain time. And then I get lost with it. I can honestly say in real life and growing as a man, because I've done a lot of maturing, a lot of growing over the years, which you've seen. I've actually maintained it on the manhood aspect for me. But on the comedy side and the stage presence and the material, that gets a little bit kind of lost sometimes where I lose track of that a little bit because I kind of know what I do something in person, but when you're on stage for a minimal amount of time, you're not really aware of exactly how much you're kind of throwing out there. That's way too much. But in an actual conversation, I could see, I could feel energy. I could see maybe a facial reaction. I could see the eyeballs kind of move when you're on stage. You don't really kind of notice a lot of those fine movements as often So that's where I get, yeah, I get, yeah, I get kind of lost a little bit. If I'm having a conversation with you and I say something that's a little odd, you're going to, 
move your face a little bit. You're going to give yeah. me an expression. I'm like, okay, I'm losing Dante. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. Harry's right. over here. I need, I need Harry, help me out. And I can go from there. And I made adjustments there. But with comedy, you're only given, what, 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And even in that, I'm not doing one bit. I'm doing multiple. So I got two minutes where I got to land this. And then that's where you get kind of lost. But again, that's the beauty part where it's like, you know what? And sometimes I get a message. Like, for example, when you hit me up that, the other day, I was like, that is true. Why didn't I realize that? Yeah. I just got lost in it. I was like, all right, shoot. He caught me slipping. But that's where I'm like, okay, now I know better. If you continue to see it that bad again, that's really us on me. But I like the fact that I caught it right away, made the adjustment, and I saw it literally within hours later. I was really happy with that. This is interesting, too, because um, I was talking about this on the Patreon where I talk about laying the five bricks. Um, and I don't really talk about it a lot on the on the actual show show, but there's a process that I put guys through to make them more comfortable talking to women and, and help them to kind of facilitate the kind of happiness they want with somebody of the opposite sex or same sex or whatever, because it actually works the same. The, the principles work the same. It's Even if it's not masculine and feminine, it's always dominant and submissive. Um, that's always the case. Those two dynamics li live in every relationship, straight, gay, or otherwise. It's always the dominant person, and you just treat that you those so those things kind of line up so one of the things i think is interesting is that the the what is the what is the reason for getting lost in the situation where you can't uh you don't see you're not picking up the cues mm -hmm. and one of the things that i realized the thing that blocks you from the cues is fear Mm -hmm. And when I say fear, you can, you know, a lot of times people take it personal because they don't know what I'm talking about in fear. But, it, but when it really doesn't even matter what I'm talking about in terms of fear, it is just fear. It could be fear of not doing well on stage. It could be fear of rejection. It could be fear of not being perceived like the person that I want to be. It could be fear. It literally could be fear of something that your mom said to you when you were little. You ain't go, mm -hmm. you ain't worth shit. You'll never do this. Or you're so nice. You're sweet. You could never stand up. Whatever it is, it's we have established these things about ourselves, and then we move on to a situation where we re recognize that these are weaknesses, and they're always in the back of our head because we know that they're weaknesses, and we don't want to fall victim to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And even if we don't fall victim to it, then a lot of times, why are we, why are we adamant about what the change is? Is because you can make the change, and then you could be too harsh. Mm -hmm. You could, you could, you don't want to come off as being an asshole, and and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, wrecking, stopping, and listening, and paying attention, and then kind of taking stock is, is a monumental thing. Um, no matter what, and um, so. Like I said, as comics, we get paid for words. Why would you give it away? Um, something as fundamental as supply and demand, right? Mm -hmm. the, the the less of a supply we have, the more expensive something is. Yeah. So the more that we use words, the more that we engage in social dynamics with women or, or whatever, and we're talking too much, we are basically discounting our words, we're making it so there's such an abundance of words. I already got it. I got the point, but you're still talking. So now there's this it, it's it's a weird thing. I remember when the whole AIDS HIV epidemic was really in the forefront. And you could walk literally you could walk into I don't know if you remember this, e, you could walk in stand up New York or comedy club, and they would have a fishbowl full of condoms. Do you remember that? I do remember seeing that, yeah. Right, so 
you know, if you think about me, even when I think about me at a time when you had to buy condoms, it was like an ordeal. Like you were afraid that the people, you yeah. don't want people, you're young, you don't want people to know you're fucking. And so you got to book condoms and maybe the girl at the cashier is old, is, is, is young. Maybe she's older and you think she's going to judge you because she's older or she's younger and you like her and you don't want to, you know, so all of these things go in your head. But we, there were so many condoms laying around you. You could just, there was a fish, but you could just stick your hand and grab a handful of condoms. Mm-hmm. We used to throw them at each other. Mm-hmm. We used to throw them at each other and shoot them at each other and fill them up, you know, because it was just this abundance of uh, of, of 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 condoms, you know, yeah. cheap ones and you know, small. They weren't giving out the Magnum XLs, but there was condoms everywhere. Any comedy club you could go to, you could get a handful of condoms. Mm-hmm. Um, what's interesting about that is because. I remember this dynamic of being a kid, you know, teenager and going to have to go to the store to buy condoms and what a what a scary ordeal that was. Mm-hmm. And now we're throwing them around at each other. We're, we're having condom fights at the time. And it yeah. always struck me as, wow, this is a situation would I would be so definitely afraid. I mean, I don't know if you ever went through that. And maybe it's not like that now, but as a young guy, man, I, I had, you know, to go and ask for condoms was like, yeah. you know, you want to make sure nobody was in line and there was no, you know, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't as open as it is now. And now, even if you want condoms, they lock them up. Right. So now you got, yeah. you got, they got to pick, we need somebody in the condom. <laughs> you know, it's just like, <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so, so what's interesting is something again, this goes, this is another life. These are all stuff that's going in my book, too. You, this inability to, to block out fear, right? The minute, so you've heard of the fight or flight syndrome, right? Like when you get scared, you either got to fight or you run, right? Yeah. That is, that's built into man's DNA, for th- two, between two and three hundred thousand years, it's because the people that didn't have that they got eaten by saber toothed tigers and and they got killed, it sucked in the water with alligators. So you had to have there's a genetic propensity for us to have this response. It's as a as a as an order of as an order of survival. So it exists. Yeah. So now. Once you introduce any level of fear, your body doesn't know the difference in the fear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your body knows the all your body knows is the fact that uh, fear is pre- represented, right? And because it's represented, um, I my adrenaline pumps with whatever I. Am I going to fight or am I going to run? But the minute it does that, the, 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 the blood doesn't pump to your brain. It pumps, pumps to your muscles and your extremities. So you're instantly less equipped to operate on a mental level. Um, and, and so you can count on whatever charisma you thought you have. Cut that down to a quarter, a third or a quarter, because now fear is 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 introduced. In this. And w- one thing that helped me actually with fear, when you first met me, you knew I had a lot of fears. Yeah, I was new into the city. I didn't know a lot of people. I was going through a rough time. I was in a dark place in my life. <clears throat> and for me, over a few years into that, like, I want to say 2015, 2018, once I started admitting to myself that I have these fears or that I'm not good at this, and then I'm mediocre here, and I'm kind of strong here. And once I kind of started admitting that to myself, that allowed me to start overcoming certain fears slowly and getting past that and becoming stronger. And as you can see, my stage presence has gotten better over the years. My vocabulary and my bits have gotten better over the years. My dating life has gotten better over the years. It was not like that when you first met me. Well, you can't fix so many- you, you can't fix a problem until you acknowledge that the problem exists. And sometimes with dudes, we 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 feel so much shame about just admitting that we're yeah. we have issues, that we're not good at something, or that yeah. we're, we're lacking. 
And why is that? That's that's what's really weird. I mean, to each his own, and I get it that not many people can do that because some fears are, you know, like high on the fear meter to them. And some can like for me, I was like, okay, what is it? I'm not good here. I'm not I'm not doing this. I'm doing this well. How can I continue to grow? Because I want to grow. I want to learn. And then I started identifying these opportunities around me. I'm like, well, Dante's my boy. He can help me out with this. This person can help me out here because he's good at this. And once I started being open and honest, like, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? How about this? How about that? And I started asking while admitting, I was like, oh, I'm getting the answers. So in reality, I'm holding myself down. I'm not allowing myself to grow. I'm not allowing myself to go stronger. Once I started doing that, everything changed overnight. And I still have fears, but I still I still go through the formula. It's just now it's a little bit of a slower process because I'm older and my fears are not as big as what they used to be. What what do you think the thing where do you think the fear originated from? Oh man. Jeez, you're talking about trauma from being a you know, young kid, being told that what, you're kind of, be... what kind of trauma? Can you talk about that? Because I always like when guys are personal about this because they, everybody's ashamed of it because they feel like this is their shortcoming. And the reality of it is that it's it's there's somebody out there that's going through this right now. And yeah. by you talking about it, it gives them a it first of all, it normalizes it for them. And second of all, it, it helps them to say, okay, I'm not alone and I can fix this. So where do you where do you think the trauma came from? I think being rejected by some of your closest ones, being made fun of because you're poor, being laughed at. Being so when you say rejected by closest ones, who do you mean? Like in specifically, who do you uh, who do you attribute that? It to? could be some family, some distant family so members. So you had family members that 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 rejected you. I wouldn't say the rejection, but it would be like the the put down. It wouldn't be in an what, actual rejection. What way? In, what, in what way? Because you were too poor or you didn't, you didn't have money no. or what? I was always trying to be funny, but I would bomb. You know, I would say something or I'd try to say something or make a point. And they'd be like, and was Shut this up. before you, you oh, yeah. did comedy? Oh, yeah. So you oh, yeah. always just was kind of wanted to be the clown. I always want even even opinions where I wasn't trying to be funny. They, hey, what, what about this? Why don't we do this? And they're like, what? What? Because... Their mentality in the Middle Eastern mentality is why should I listen to the young kid when I'm the older one? So are you talking about your brothers, your sisters, your dad? No, I could be distant cousins, cousins, you know, just people that I wasn't even, I wasn't necessarily in the actual household, but they were family. We'd see each other at gatherings and it'd just be like, you know, certain situations where it would just be a put down and it would just be like, you would make me feel like shit. What's the just, what's the worst put down you ever got? The one that really that sticks out in your mind that you that's kind of stung. I think when I started telling the family that I was gonna do stand up, and that was I, it was the worst hurtful response. What'd your mom I ever say? Got. What'd your mom say? My mom was okay with it. She what did she like, say? Though? Okay, okay. But my dad was like, "Ha!" Ah. Like it was like, "All right, I got to see this." My cousins laughed. My cousins laughed in my face mm -hmm. and I was like, all right, it's like as, as in, uh, insecure as I was and dealing with childhood trauma and, and not fitting in or thinking that I'm weird and I'm odd. There was still this little piece in me that was like, I'm gonna show you Watch what's what the, the, fuck what's I the do. thing. What's the thing that stands out in your head? As far as what that, that, out. that thing that like we all have that thing that because stands. I actually felt it. I actually felt it. But what, who did you find it? Who did you feel it from? And what was said specifically? What was the thing? It was the night that I I knew I had something to offer as it's something in the comedic world. I just knew I was. You no, know, what was said to you that was the what was the kick in the balls out of the thing that stands out in your brain? Straight laughter. Once from, I said that who? I was gonna do from who? His cousins. 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 From like close cousins. Close cousins. And what did they just laughed and said what? It was in a living room. It was in Northern California. And I said, Hey guys, I'm gonna start doing stand up. 
And it was just, I killed. Like, <laughs> literally, I just killed. Uh, and I will never forget that. Did but they I, say anything after they left? No, or they just left. They just left. And you have to understand, too, this is the first in my family tree that somebody's really getting into the arts. So in the Middle Eastern culture, you know, if you tell somebody you want to be a stand-up, and keep in mind, Egyptians are just known for, you know, internet jokes, one-liners, stupid little jokes. So you be like, oh, I want to do stand-up. I'll tell you something funny. And then they'll tell you something that they they saw on the internet or somebody told them, you know, from. but they don't take this as an art. And Middle Eastern comedy is very, very young. It's not like African American. Yeah, comedy. it just it's doesn't like exist in that in that world in the sense of yes. like it's not a, even a thing that they see somebody doing. Like yeah. that, even it, it's I very mean, we, it's very strange because it, you know the cultures. There's enough technology where they've seen Eddie Murphy movies, they've seen stand up, but it's weird because yeah. these cultures isolate themselves. Because I deal with the same thing with Armenians and Turks and. You know, there's that mentality of like, oh, yeah, yeah, but that's not a thing that we do. That's a thing that white people or black people do. We don't yeah. have that in our culture. But it's so funny that it's so dumb that we limit ourselves in that capacity. Like, just because you are you don't know somebody who's done it doesn't mean that an Egyptian person can't. You're, you're an American, too. It's not even like they just sometimes people like to close themselves in. And maybe that's out of fear because it's an, a very isolated culture because you have to look out for yourselves as immigrants when you come over here. And that's yeah. part of it. But you put yourself in these, you know, you, what, do you, what do you call it, the golden cage or whatever. Mm -hmm. We just isolate ourselves. Just the notion that you would attempt to do that. And they're like, that's fucking ridiculous. That's like, and we've I've never heard, heard of from, that. And I've heard it from Asian comics. I've heard it from Indian comics. Not really much of the Latino family, but still, you can run into... Um, a Latino comic and he'll tell you like, Hey, I wanted to tell I, when the day I told my parents or my family that I was going to do stand up, you're not going to get the best reaction. Yeah. But there's also a situation where you don't get any, they don't give a fuck about what you're doing either way. So right. yeah. it's like, what does this got to do with me type yeah. thing? Yeah. Um, well, my, my so parents, have... I knew that they didn't, I, I knew enough to know by 18 when I started doing comedy that I didn't give a fuck about their opinion about it so i literally didn't tell them they found out by accident or whatever yeah. and then it was the reaction that i knew was gonna be my mom who's ecuadorian said she'd rather i i, I own a hot dog cart than to do stand-up comedy wow. i was like oh that's why i didn't tell you because Man. you're a fucking idiot and then that's it but not everyone had not everyone gets to that level so right i was just but lucky to, but, to be at that level but to to add more to your um question dante yeah, it was a combination of fear from, you know, let's say the the, the rejection from the family, the rejection from the girls, um, the re rejection from you know guys that are trying to you know get in their little cliques because you know how, like right. back then there were more groups, there were more cliques that you would hang with, you know, not more individual people now, more short uh, smaller groups now. Right. So it was a combination of like, damn, I am failing and bombing everywhere I go. And it kept balling up this ball of insecurity. And I'm not good enough. I don't look good enough. I'm not. And mind you, I'm not even like a, you know, kind of an ugly guy. I'm a fairly decent man. And I can comfortably say that. But, but years ago, I didn't believe that. And it was just so much rejection. So this was also a matter of looks to height, looks, everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm i glad now, that you said that people... because you said that a lot of people deal with this. Yeah. Yes, it was a ball of, it was it was a jar like you said the jar of condoms. It was, yeah. it was a jar of this and this and this, and it almost got to the scary point where I'm like, dude, I'm not good enough for anything. What okay. the fuck am I good at? And right. it killed me on the inside. And that's when I slowly started admitting to yourself, okay, you know what, man, I'm gonna fucking do this shit. I can't. No, no, this is like, thank God I was able to grab the reins, and I was like, you know what. I'm going to fucking succeed somewhere and do something. I'm mm. going to get better at this. I'm going to get better at talking to women. I'm going to get better at understanding women. I'm going to get better at making money. I'm going to get better at stage time. If I'm doing five minutes, I want to do a crisp three and a half, four minutes. Get the fuck off. I'm going to be better at. Did, um, did, did you have people who were less attractive than you and who were maybe even shorter than you talking shit as well? Because I find 
a lot of times you get people, hurt people, hurt people. And so yeah. you get somebody who's shorter than you, who's less attractive, and they'll be talking shit. You know, like, but when you talk about, you know, Harry's mom is wild for the night. She is right? wild for the night. Yeah, we've, yeah, <laughs> so, she's wild. So the fact that she would even put a judgment about Harry, you know, um, does she have a degree, Harry, your mom? A, de a degree? Yeah. What? No. I think she went to a, a beauty school that burned down mysteriously. That's as Did close as an that education. Did she at all? I don't know if she burned. No, she didn't Did do any. She was a bus driver. She had her CDL license at one point. She was a very, she, she's still alive. Uh, she's a very smart and crafty woman, but she didn't have a degree, you know? She's she was devious. a cleaning lady. <laughs> right. A cleaning right. lady. Worked so hard, this but. In, this is what's interesting, how somebody who has achieved nothing in terms of any magnitude has the has the, the oh, sheer God. gall yeah. to go, I'd rather you be a, a hot dog, you know, I'd rather you be on so a hot, hot dog dogs stand. than, than yeah. follow any sort of dream because it's that, just, yeah, it's the audacity. But what that is, is, is a, a manifestation of fear. So she's an immigrant who came yeah. to this country. She wanted better for her son. But instead of saying that, she manifests it by saying a hot dog cart. Like she yeah. doesn't even understand what it is. She's such a fearful, fearful person. Both my yeah. parents were, they were so negative and fearful and they just, that was her way of trying to, to not let me go down a, a danger, in her head, a dangerous road. Also, but it's still also, fuck it's her. her being afraid of herself. Sure. Putting yourself, putting herself in your place and then, you know, dogging it so that this is something. Because it's, it's with me, I always remember that, you know, my father was a really dynamic dude. And I've said this a hundred times, but he was a dynamic, extraordinary dude when people were watching. Mm -hmm. Like if he had an audience, like if he had, if there was a crowd of people and there was a a, a, a a baby in a Bill Burnham building, he would he's the type of dude would open a hydrant and wet his coat and run up and go get the baby. But if if the if the baby was in the window. And there was no audience. He would pull his hat down and be like, "Let me keep going." Like, like, and so um, his fear, uh, his fear, like it manifested in it, in itself because of the fact that uh, he always said to me, "I want you to be better. I want you to be stronger. I want you to be bigger. I want you to be tougher. I want you to be smarter." And he said these things. And then when I started to when I started to excel um, and I was smarter than now, my, my father had an eighth grade education, sixth grade education. And, and even though he was a, a, an extraordinarily smart guy in terms of common sense, but he never was like formally educated. And uh, he's a dude that would get a, like he'd get a new word. Like he'd come across astronomical. And then for, six months to a year that was in his vocabulary everything was astronomical like this was his word but when he when i started to educate myself and i had surpassed him education what he was he started to become afraid because he felt like he wouldn't have his place in my life i would not mm -hmm. be able to look up to him because i was smarter i had already my father was five two so you know, mm -hmm. I was taller than him, like pretty much in at the end of elementary school, and so that became a thing. And then I had, you know, I was a big, I was lifting weights, and I was a big dude, and you know, and so just, just his insecurity became, I became a symbol of what he wasn't, and then he became abusive because of that. So it's an interesting thing how people, you know, I say hurt people, hurt people. And um, there's so much, if I had known this stuff at that time, I would be like, I wouldn't even been upset about it. You know, I had, right. I had learned, I had to find a way to forgive him because, you know, like I say, he was born in 1920 during literally segregation and Jim Crow, which is a whole nother thing, another level of stress. But to deal with that and, and to just, to for me to just recognize that I intimidating him and, and my the better I got was more intimidating. And then it became a situation when I really did understand I was about 23 and I started, then I would, I was abusive. 
Mm-hmm. Like I would flaunt it in his face. Like, you know, just I remember he him being uh uh I, I remember him telling me about like he had he was older and he, you know, he had uh uh not prostate cancer, but he had enlarged pro- prostate. And I was like, uh he was like, um, uh, yeah, you ain't this, you ain't that. And I was like, Yeah, and you, and you piss in your pants. So how about tough guy? How tough are you? Did you piss your pants, huh? I don't know no gangsters that pissed their pants. How about that? And it was just like because he was being a, an asshole. He was yeah. he was being an he was abusive. Yeah, and yeah, then you abusive. had to shut him down because he was being a dick. Because because he could he thought he could get away with it as your dad because you had to yeah. had to respect him. And then you'd have to shut him down. Which also was an interesting thing that bit him on the ass because he used to tell me. To that respect is a two-way street. You have to give it to get it. And then he wouldn't give it, and he thought because he was my father, he could, he could maintain that kind of disrespect. And then when he didn't give it, and I was like, oh, this is oh, this is how we rocking? Okay. And then he would be like, I'm your father. And I was like, yeah, and you're supposed to, res- you want respect. Yeah. And I would throw it back in his face, which just really, so we, we, we were really kind of, you know, destined to spread apart. And so I, I, I think what's, you know, when you talk about this confidence, I mean, I think the first thing, and this is for the listeners, the first thing you have to do is you have to recognize who is critiquing you. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure you qualify them. Now, that just because you qualify them or don't qualify them doesn't make that the criticism that they're giving you is not valid. It could still be valid. Correct. The problem yep. is, the problem is, if even if it is valid, right? You still have to go through the checklist to see whether it's valid or not, you know? Yeah. So simply because it comes from somebody who might be with the intention of hurting your feelings doesn't mean that the, the, criticism, the criticism is not valid. Yeah. But you got to start to remove yourself from the emotion. So this is, again, this, the other principle is you remove the emotion from, from what you're thinking about so that you can look at it in a in a clear way anybody who fights if you if you box if you mma you judo taekwondo if you're if you're in school you're taking te- if you're angry fight or flight kicks in and then you can you can literally cut down on your efficiency by a, at least a third because yeah. your brain and is not getting the oxygen and stuff to to act most efficiently and so when I say lay the five bricks and I do it, it it's just a, a, a repetition of exposure therapy where you're talking to five women a day, every day, who you don't are not looking to fuck. They can be attractive, but they don't have to be. It can be an old lady, a young lady. A, it could be the lady at the at the supermarket, be the librarian. Just pay her a compliment so that you're accustomed to talking. You're accustomed to talking in a real way. And the compliment you get has to be honest. You cannot come. You can't take a 600 pound woman and tell her she looks skinny. If you got to compliment her toenails, that's what you do. But it, it had better be something that you're honest about that you're complimenting. Because if you do that, we hope here's, here's another crazy thing. We in fear, we lie. If you're afraid and you have these insecurities, and I'm not saying you specifically, but all of us, we all lie. Yeah. You have to practice being honest. Yeah. Like you would think that you wouldn't have to You just go, I'm going to just be honest. But, you know, when you talk about the magnitude in which we lie with things that we're insecure, things that we don't want to be, that we don't want to be exposed. We're so accustomed to lying that we lie and lie and lie and lie and lie. And then we're never telling the truth. So just the, the first step of everything that I teach is laying the five bricks, five a day, every day shows discipline and consistency, credibility that you make a promise and you follow through. It, second of all, it, 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 it removes the anxiety. And third mm-hmm. of all, it's a practice in being honest. Yeah. Because Agreed. those are the things that are most, the, first, those are the principles. It's ace, authenticity, credibility, and empathy, right? I'm saying you listen. You have to listen when you are on dates because that's the empathy. Let me see. But you're also gathering information. And, and just that one step becomes so 
life changer. Who's the kid? We are Jason Walker or Josh. What's the guy from Wild and Out? The one oh, with I the... forgot what his name was. Jeez, hold J- on. Uh, I think it's Jason. I think it is. Um, but we've been putting him. I mean, and that dude is killing it because he's just. I haven't heard from him in a while, but he um um you know hold on. Jacob. Jacob, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jacob, Jacob Williams. Jacob Williams, yeah. Um, and so we even diagnose, you know, even from talking to him, I diagnose he speaks in a very monotone voice. <laughs> and all of these things can be read as these insecurities because these insecurities, you speak in a monotone voice because you don't want to be heard. <laughs> you you it's it's a way in which you withdraw, yeah. right? So that nobody hears you, so that you're invisible. And then upon further talks with him and consultation with him, you you basically diagnose, oh, you so you you couldn't speak up in your household. He was yeah, yeah, my father was abusive, my mother was abusive, you know, emotionally abusive. So you, you just when they ask you questions, you're mumbling and you because yeah. you don't you're hoping they don't hear you, you're hoping that you're not seen. And all of those things communicate now when you're in a regular relationship and your voice is monitored. So because if your voice has has levels, right? Your voice has levels in comedy. It's it's what makes it interesting. Yeah. To the same token, and here was what 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 it, this is interesting. What I was saying about uh, E was I was like you're yelling. I was just about to say that. Yeah, you. That was uh, like talk- what two weeks prior. Yeah. I had I get <clears throat> sometimes too excited. <clears throat> excuse me. In a bit where I'm constantly yelling. And I remember one specific day, not too long ago, Dante literally was like, E, have you ever heard of like an equalizer where you just adjust the treble, the bass? Down? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, <clears throat> do your bits like that. Start off high here, go low here, do this, do that, go up and down. And I didn't do it for, I think, a few times. And you're like, you would kind of roll your eyes in a funny way, like, here you go again, <laughs> yelling for no reason. And the one... Yeah. One time I did it, and you're like, E, I watched it. Good set. Good job. I swear to you, it made me feel good, but I also felt good. And I remember coming back to you. But you could feel it, though. You, I remember you could feel it. And I was like, Dante, it worked. And he was like, yes, man, I told you. I tried to tell you several times. And I was like, I know, man, but thank you for being patient with me. I actually thanked him for being patient. Not just, oh, thanks for the tip. Thanks for being patient and constantly reminded me. He didn't just do it one time. So I took that. I was like, somebody's trying to help me. Why don't I listen and apply right away? That laziness is like maybe hearing it, putting it on the shelf, and then I'll get to it. I'll get to it. It's not just that, but it also might be that, like I said before, the instinct is uh, to not want to acknowledge that you... uh, the, it's almost like taking help would be a sign of weakness. And as guys, we just are kind of trained and programmed True. to not be weak at any point. And I'm know? glad that you said that, Harry. Yeah. That is the worst thing that, like, it hurt me. It crumbled me. It put me in the worst fucking place of my life. When you start feeling that, like, oh, if I get help, uh, advice or tips, it's a sign of weakness, you are going to have a hard time in life. I believe, I'm religious, I believe that God uses like people and messengers to give you stuff that you've been praying for or asking for. The world, the universe is going to use Dante or Harry or another comic or a booker or a bartender. It could be somebody off the street and they're delivering what you need to hear. It doesn't matter where somebody else is in life, but just like Dante said earlier, kind of do the credibility. But at the same time, you cannot deny something that is right. You cannot deny it. No, let me let me push back on this God shit. Your <laughs> God does not use me. He has no control over me. He, I decide who I want to help and who I don't want. And I don't give a fuck what he said. I don't know what kind of goofy guy you got. Maybe what is it? Are you it's Muslim or Catholic? Christian, Dante. Christian. Christian. So I don't give a fuck about that dude. He don't have nothing to do with me. Mm. He don't control my life. I make my own decisions and I have freedom of choice. And so you, you have to understand part of our inability to to accept the truth is because that we're not 
and this is this is why I'm an atheist. I'm not telling you to be an atheist, but I just want to take this into consideration. Okay. If you work hard at changing something, why would you give that that the glory of that to somebody who didn't do it? So there's so many times, gotcha. There's so many times that I have given you advice and you've ignored me. You mm. said yourself, you put it on, on the shelf until you were ready. So you have taken the time. Much the way they to, ignored Jesus at first, right, Dante? <laughs> they, they don't, you know, never listen to him. Much don't the way never they, listen to that guy. A man right? comes down, he's got a little bit of a different look than everybody else. He he's starts telling a, a new bit way of, a of hippie. life. Nobody wants to listen to him. Nobody wants, and everyone goes, it. we got to, you know, he starts saying some revolutionary ideas that disrupt the whole system. And everyone goes, and we like, got to kill him. We got to crucify that guy. So what, what, what I'm saying is there's literally a situation where when you give that glory to somebody other than you, because you could have never, you could have, you, I mean, do you, do you believe in freedom of choice? I do. Okay. So if you believe in freedom of choice, who made the effort to take the advice and implement the advice? You did. Who took that advice, implemented it? Who was ready to take the fat one if I was wrong? You. So you cannot. I, I don't. I, that That is so beyond me why you would fight the advice in the first place. Bring yourself to bring yourself close enough so that you could actually actually do something about it and then give the glory to somebody else when it was you that made it's, the decision. No, no, no. It's not that I decided to ignore it, Dante. And again, I'm, I'm you being very honest. You absolutely did ex ignore it. it, it, it decided that. You, I'm also admitting to you that I'm also, I was a work in progress. That's, I've you're, you're missing my point. I understand you're, you're, what your point is. I'm saying that I was is never that I did not want to listen to it. That's not I would, the point. You were afraid to. I understand that. It, you were uh, you yes, were afraid to do. I was afraid to uh, implement something that I thought I wasn't ready for yet or in that particular bit or in that You're particular You're giving set. it too much attention. You were afraid to do it because you were afraid to do it. And it's okay to be afraid. It's yeah. oh, that's okay. So yeah. I don't need you to give me a disclaimer on how. But I don't want you to understand. I don't want you to take it like I'm not taking it. Ignoring it. Let me explain something to you. I'm not taking it anyway. I give advice. I give the right advice to people all the time. Very rarely. I, there's people who are on the page or who are on listen to the podcast all the time, and then I get them on a consultation. I go, "Did you do what I tell you to do?" And ninety eight percent of them go, "No." Well, I did. A little bit da, 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 because most people are full of shit. They don't have the ability to 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 implement the advice. They don't have. They're not willing to put it put their well put or feet or in. the the fear is there and they don't uh, you know it's for well, whatever reason get, sometimes get over, they yeah. want to and they can't. Sometimes they they can't. Sometimes they they were afraid. Any number it doesn't matter. This is the point. When you humble yourself in a real sense and you go, I didn't do it. And if I ask you why you do it, we could talk about why you didn't do it. I would just, I know what it was. It was fear. It was fear of failing, fear of changing, fear of doing something. So I don't take it personal. People don't listen to me all the time. I'm giving them the blueprint 90% of the time and they don't listen. My point is, why would you add, enter a God into that? When this was, because who, who failed you? Who was kicking? Who was kicking you in the ass, sweeping you so that you were too afraid? Was God holding your head underwater, keeping you from doing that? Dante, as a religion, no, no, no. Who did God keep you from from being? Did He hold your head under the water and and stop you from taking advantage of the information that I gave you? No, no. Okay. What I'm so then, who took it upon themselves? To say, I'm going to make this change and do something that's really difficult. And who did that? I, okay. I think, okay. Who, I who answer my question first. I'm trying to answer it, Dante. But what I'm trying to tell you is the way I believe, the way I see the world is that I believe that messages come at certain times in your life and that certain lessons come at certain parts, so certain times in your life. Sometimes you miss them 
and sometimes they come again. You came into my life, actually, it was a, you were a great friend, you were always patient with me, you always helped me out. I never intentionally, but what I'm telling you is, I believe, this is what I believe, you atheists, I believe what, you know, I respect what you, you know, believe in and what you don't believe in. This is you and this is who you are. Here's the I'm thing, not, I don't respect I'm saying, what you, this is what you know, I don't let respect. Me ask, let me ask you something. So well, why? Let me, say, let, me, let me be clear. I don't respect what, you, what you're saying and I'll tell you why I don't respect it. I don't respect it because no God told me, there was no message. My friendship with you was the reason why I stepped up to help you. It and was no vision. I didn't get a warm feeling in Dante, my balls. It was I, me caring Dante, about you. I mean, you, you might have gotten a warm feeling in your balls, but that was Dante, unrelated. Yeah, that's, that's unrelated. Absolutely. First, Dante, I know you have a good heart, man, because I see yeah, what but, you do to other my, comics, and I see what you do to other good heart. people that you help. My but good don't heart has think, nothing to do with God. It no, has no, but what I'm trying to tell you is I believe that God is, you know, he puts certain people in your life to help you. It's bullshit. That's what I, why? So you don't think <laughs> that. It's, it's ridiculous. Right. Because, ridiculous. Because, because here's the thing, man. Why does God put other people, why did God put Adolf Hitler into all of our lives? Why does God put, you know. I can't answer. No, hold on. I can't God answer works any in of those questions. I can't answer any of all those questions. But all right. I'm saying is certain people in my life I've cut out. I don't talk to anymore. There's certain comics I won't even talk to at all anymore. My Fair circle enough. of friends of comics is very small. And who did that? The God cut him out or you cut him out? No, there was an uh, there was. Why would God to put Todd learned. Lynn in all of our lives, E man? Why did God do that to all of us? I don't know. You have your yeah, you have I, your beliefs. Dante, I try to pay it a compliment, but I I hope it's, you understand. I, it brother. is a compliment. It is a it compliment. It really is because I really well, I want you to understand. You, and I you lesson, you a lot. Listen, but you understand this. You lessen the compliment by putting some bullshit myth deity in it. When I cared about you, you can you can you could make a face, but nobody can. I didn't get a message. No angel came to me. I was like, this is a dude that's working hard to be better. He's a friend of mine and I am going to lift him up. It wasn't I'm no angel. I'm not super. I'm not spiritual. I said I want to help this dude. And I'm not going to let you say it was God's master. Fuck him. Fuck that dude. I did it because I thought you were worth it. And I'm not going to let you tell me that somehow it was a master plan. That somebody that had nothing. Don't take my credit and give it to some myth that you that you think about because you've been programmed in that way. Because it's not. Because I could have just turned my head the other way and said nothing. Could I have not? True. And this and I true. couldn't have and I couldn't have uh, ignored this this uh fucking sign from fucking let's go to the Patreon. Anyway, look, let's we'll talk, we'll finish this. Believe we'll it or not, you shit. you you like E Man. You love E Man. I love E Man, but you're not gonna take my I fucking go out of my way and then he tells me somehow in a master plan. God, fuck God. I don't give a fuck about anybody. Listen, fuck your God, fuck your Islam, fuck all your sh because people make decisions. Here's an interesting. I'm gonna say something that people say: good, good people do good things, bad people do bad things. When is religion is involved, when re let me finish. R when re religion is involved, it's the only time that you get good people to do bad things. In the name of religion, we gotta we gotta do Patreon. Come on, because we gonna get into this when we oh. go on the other side. So, look at Harry's so all nervous now. I'm like, but go ahead, Harry, plug your shit. E, I'll plug my you uh, yeah. Plug your stuff, E man. Uh, He'll be at the media. church tomorrow night, uh, doing a, a special appearance. I'm, be, I'm doing a retreat, a Christian retreat. Sorry, E man, go for it, but. Go on the Go visit family for the next week. Uh, I come back in the city, and then I'll start doing back in uh, stand-up New York and some locals um, in the next two weeks. Where can people follow you on social media? E-Man Morgan, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Any shows coming up? Anything? Uh, no, nah, I'm away for the next two weeks with fam. And when I get back in the two weeks, that's when I'll start posting up my local spots. And right, E-Man's a right. funny dude. He's really become a really good Very comic funny. over the years. I love yeah, him to death. Dude. Love him like a brother. Uh, Thanks, Harry, brother. talk to me. 
Uh, you could find all my stuff, all my social media at uh, uh, Harry Turjanian on YouTube, on TikTok, the whole deal. Uh, and that's where you can follow my stuff. If you want any relationship consultations, you could email me at advicefromharry at gmail.com. And that's uh, where we can set up a consultation. Uh, I'm Dante Nero. Uh, you know, Google me, bitch. Um, <laughs> if y'all want consultations, DanteNero.com. Click on consult. You know how to get me. GYBB, get your balls back. WWDD, what would Dante do? The Sexual Revolution podcast. Please support us on Patreon. It's uh, www.patreon.com slash manschool202. Uh, I love y'all, man. Let's get at it.